Our reading today is coming from John's Gospel. It's chapter 2, uh, the first physical miracle that Jesus performs in John's Gospel, uh, the wedding in Cana. The event follows, of course, the spectacular prologue in John's first chapter and the calling of the disciples. So John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and the, Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine left. You must not tell me what to do, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Jesus' mother then told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. The Jews have rules about ritual washing, and for this purpose six stone water jars were there, each one large enough to hold about a hundred litres. Jesus said to the servants, Fill these jars with water. They filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some water out and take it to the man in charge of the feast. They took him the water which now had turned into wine, and he tasted it. He did not know where this wine had come from, but of course the servants who had drawn out the water knew. So he called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone else serves the best wine first, and after the guests have had plenty to drink, he serves the ordinary wine, but you have kept the best wine until now. Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana in Galilee. There he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. It's a um, wonderful, wonderful story uh, on the surface. And there is so much more beneath the surface. Let's look at that last line. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, belief, of course, is everything that John's Gospel is about. We jump straight over to chapter 20 and verse 31. These things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. Belief, because seeing is never believing. Um, recent... Uh, massive press on the internet and elsewhere with the launch of the new uh, space telescope um, about the nature of reality and a reinterest, if you like, in quantum physics and the whole idea that what we see and experience in this large world that we inhabit is relatively predictable. But the more we unpick, the more we dive into the small, the less that works. And the very nature of reality is so strange and so different from the physical big things that we see around us and how we move and uh, the forces that we exert. So different. Seeing and believing. Pilate says to the end of Jesus at the end of their interview, what is truth? And there is always that sense that what we see on the surface may not be be the actual ultimate reality. It may work for us. What we see in the story is water being turned into wine. But what John is saying here is so much more than that. So never want to waste a single word. There was a wedding. Now in the Old Testament, God often is betrayed or portrayed rather as the bridegroom to Israel, his bride. You remember the old prophet, Old Testament prophet Hosea, uh, whose wife Gomer uh, was unfaithful to him. And he uses that analogy time and again. Unfaithful Gomer, unfaithful Israel, God the husband. And the bridegroom is an image that's used throughout John's gospel quite often to portray Jesus. So there was a wedding. Um, probably we've all been to at least one wedding and we know in our own context what that means because we don't know what it means to go to a wedding in first century Cana but we can take some stab but 
the actual events of the wedding, the actual bride and bridegroom and everything that's going on there, we're not told anything about that whatsoever. But it's a wedding, a joining together of two people. And that imagery of God and God's relationship with his people is paramount here. So Jesus' mother was there, we're told, and Jesus was there too. As the Messiah, the conquering, wonderful king of glory, the one who comes with armies. No, Jesus comes with others. He comes with his disciples. He comes with the new Israel. So the new Israel is present at this wedding. The wine had given out, we're told, in an almost throwaway line, like that would be a standard thing to happen. In fact, of course, it would be a terrible tragedy if it were to happen. Um, but it is a bad thing that happens in that event. All the hospitality, all that extravagance, all that sense of care and wanting people to have a good time, that had exhausted. Oh no, the wedding ceremony was ruined. And we don't know in what way Mary said to um, uh, to Jesus, the wine has given out. Whether it was an invitation for him to do something, I guess in John's Gospel it probably was. Because in John's Gospel, there's never any uncertainty that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing and exactly who he is. But he says to her, you must not tell me what to do. My time has not yet come. And she says to the servants, and these are invited guests. She says to the servants, do whatever he says. I mean, what power she has to command the servants but her belief in Jesus' ability to do something to make the situation better is entire and complete. So Jesus tells the, the um, servants to do this thing. So we have six enormous stone jars uh, used to hold the water for purification. So into the wedding ceremony, people come and they do what the law prescribes to make them ritually pure as part of their religious observance. All the water has gone. They don't have to empty the jars. The water has been used. People are ritually purified in this wedding. Jesus comes and they top up for new pure purification. But this time, and we're told, aren't we, that the servants filled the jars to the brim exuberant, extravagant, huge. And we're told how that water, when it's drawn out and tasted, has already turned into wine, the best wine that anyone's ever tasted. So Jesus, the new bridegroom, comes into this ceremony and he makes a new wedding with the people who are there just as he makes a new wedding, a new union, with all people everywhere. And it's the best wedding, the best wine, the best communion, the most wonderful taste that people have ever experienced. The um, servants who give the water to the man who's owning the feast, um, they draw it out and they call the bridegroom and he says, that's wonderful. You've kept the best wine until now. The best wine, the best wedding, the best bridegroom. So all of this happens within the context of a civil cere of a ceremony. Um, and uh, of course, what we see here is the brand new best relationship that God is giving with people everywhere. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So for you and I, we already know in a post-resurrection age that Jesus has come, that Jesus, through God's grace, has found us, through his death on the cross, that he has taken away all our guilt and sin. He has died literally for us that we may be made new and have a new covenant, that we may be part of this new wedding, part of this new relationship. And it's here and it's now. And the thing about this new relationship, this new creation that John talked about in his first chapter prologue is just so significant. It's just so huge and it's just so important. 
all of us can experience the new bridegroom in this new relationship, taste this wonderful new wine, and we would say this is the best. We've experienced lots of other things, but this is the best we've ever experienced. And that's how it is when you know God's love for you in your heart. It is just the most treasured, the most wonderful thing. And it is like a party, uh, fueled by wine and good company, by laughter and dancing. It is glorious. It is joyous. It is uplifting. It is life-giving. And that's what a relationship with God is like. And that's what John's saying in this verse, in this first miracle story, that Jesus comes, God in human form, and makes the party really happen. Everything else has been mere stuff. Now is the real event.